Where are the closets? Tessie asked as soon as we got inside. Closets? The kitchen's a million miles away from the family room, Milt. Every time you want a snack, you have to traipse all the way across the house. <laughs> It'll give us some exercise. And how am I supposed to find curtains for those windows? They don't make curtains that big. Everyone can see right in. Think of it this way. We can see right out. But then there was a scream at the other end of the house. Mama! Against her better judgment, Desdemona had pressed a button on the wall. What kind door this is? She was shouting as we all came running. It moved by itself. Hey, cool, said Chapter 11. Try it, Cal. Put your head in the doorway. Yeah, like that. Don't fool with that door, kids. I'm just testing the pressure. Ow! What did I tell you, bird brain? Now get your sister out of the door. I'm trying. The button doesn't work. What do you mean it doesn't work? Oh, this is wonderful, Milt. No closets. And now we have to call the fire department to get Callie out of the door. It's not designed to have someone's neck in it. Mona! Can you breathe, honey? Yeah, but it hurts. It's like that guy at Carlsbad Caverns, said Chapter 11. He got stuck and they had to feed him for 40 days and then he finally died. Stop wriggling, Callie. You're making it. I'm not wriggling. I can see Callie's underwear. I can see Callie's underwear. Stop that right now. Here, Tessie, take Callie's leg. Okay, on three. A one and a two and a three. We didn't need to speak to each other. We understood each other without speaking. But then a terrible thing happened. It is a Saturday morning, a few weeks after our move to Middlesex. Lefty is taking me for a walk around the new neighborhood. The plan is to go down to the lake. Hand in hand, we stroll across our new front lawn. Change is clinking in his trouser pocket just below the level of my shoulders. I run my fingers over his thumb, fascinated by the missing nail, which Lefty has always told me a monkey bit off at the zoo. Now we reach the sidewalk. The man who makes the sidewalks in Gross Point has left his name in the cement, J.P. Steiger. There's also a crack where ants are having a war. Now we are crossing the grass between the sidewalk and the street, and now we are at the curb. I step down. Lefty doesn't. Instead, he drops cleanly, six inches into the street, still holding his hand. I laugh at him for being so clumsy. Lefty laughs, too, but he doesn't look at me. He keeps staring straight ahead into space, and gazing up, I suddenly can see things about my grandfather I should be too young to see. I see fear in his eyes and bewilderment, and most astonishing of all, the fact that some adult worry is taking precedence over our walk together. The sun is in his eyes, his pupils contract. We remain at the curb in its dust and leaf matter. Five seconds, ten seconds, long enough for Lefty to come face to face with the evidence of his own diminished faculties and for me to feel the onrush of my own growing ones. What nobody knew. Lefty had had another stroke the week before. Already speechless, he now began to suffer spatial disorientation. Furniture advanced and retreated in the mechanical manner of a funhouse. Like practical jokers, chairs offered themselves and then pulled away at the last moment. The diamonds of the backgammon board undulated like player piano keys. Lefty told no one. Because he no longer trusted himself to drive, Lefty started taking me on walks instead. That was how we'd arrived at that curb, the curb he couldn't wake up and turn away from in time. We went along Middlesex, the silent old foreign gentleman and his skinny granddaughter, a girl who talked enough for two, who babbled so fluently that her father, the ex-clarinet man, liked to joke she knew circular breathing. I was getting used to Gross Point, to the genteel mothers in chiffon headscarves, and to the dark, cypress-shrouded house where the one Jewish family lived, having also paid cash, whereas my grandfather was getting used to a much more terrifying reality, holding my hand to keep his balance as trees and bushes made strange sliding movements in his peripheral vision, Lefty was confronting the possibility that consciousness was a biological accident. Though he'd never been religious, he realized now that he'd always believed in the soul, in a force of personality that survived death. But as his mind continued to waver, to short circuit, he finally arrived at the cold-eyed conclusion 
so at odds with his youthful cheerfulness, that the brain was just an organ like any other, and that when it failed, he would be no more. Squatting at the front window yesterday, Milton had seen looters break into every store down the block. They looted the Jewish market, taking everything but the matzah and the yardside candles. With a sharp sense of style, they stripped Joel Moskowitz's shoe store of its higher-priced and more fashionable models, leaving only some orthopedic offerings and a few floor shimes. All that was left in Dyer's appliance, as far as Milton could tell, was a rack of vacuum bags. What would they loot if they looted the diner? Would they take the stained glass window, which Milton himself had taken? Would they show interest in the photo of Ty Cobb snarling as he slid spikes first into second base? Maybe they'd rip the zebra skins off the bar stools. They liked anything African, didn't they? Wasn't that the new Vogue or the old Vogue that was new again? Hell, they could have the goddamn zebra skins. He'd put them out front as a peace offering. But now Milton heard something. The doorknob, was it? He listened. For the last few hours, he'd been hearing things. His eyes had been playing tricks on him, too. He crouched behind the counter, squinting into the darkness. His ears echoed the way seashells do. He heard the distant gunfire and the squawking sirens. He heard the hum of the refrigerator and the ticking of the clock. To all this was added the rush of his blood, roaring through the channels in his head. But no sound came from the doorway. Milton relaxed. He took another bite of the sandwich. Gently, experimentally, he lowered his head onto the counter just for a minute. When he closed his eyes, the pleasure was immediate. Then the doorknob rattled again, and Milton jumped. He shook his head, trying to wake himself up. He put down the sandwich and tiptoed out from behind the counter, holding the gun. He didn't intend to use it. The idea was to scare the looter off. If that didn't work, Milton was prepared to leave. The Oldsmobile was parked out back. He could be home in ten minutes. The knob rattled again. And without thinking, Milton stepped toward the glass door and shouted, I've got a gun! Except it wasn't the gun. It was the ham sandwich. Milton was threatening the looter with two pieces of toasted bread, a slice of meat, and some hot mustard. Nevertheless, because it was dark out, this worked. The looter outside the door held up his hands. It was Morrison from across the street. Milton stared at Morrison. Morrison stared back. And then my father said, This is what white people say in a situation like this. Can I help you? Morrison squinted, disbelieving. What you doing here, man? You crazy? Ain't safe for no white people down here. A shot rang out. Morrison flattened himself against the glass. Ain't safe for nobody. I gotta protect my property. Your life? Ain't your property? Morrison raised his eyebrows to indicate the unimpeachable logic of this statement. Then he dropped the superior expression altogether and coughed. <coughs> Listen, chief, long as you here, maybe you can help me out. He held up small change. Came over for some cigarettes. Milton's chin dipped, fattening his neck, and his eyebrows slanted in disbelief. In a dry voice, he said, Now'd be a good time to kick the habit. Another shot rang out, this time closer. Morrison jumped, then smiled. <laughs> it sure is bad for my health, and getting more dangerous all the time. Then he smiled broadly. This'll be my last pack, he said. Swear to God. He dropped the change through the mail slot. Parliaments. Milton looked down at the coins for a moment and then went and got the cigarettes. Got any matches, Morrison said. Milton slipped these through too. As he did, the riots, his frayed nerves, the smell of fire in the air, and the audacity of this man Morrison dodging sniper fire for a pack of cigarettes all became too much for Milton. Suddenly, he was waving his arms, indicating everything and shouting through the door, What's the matter with you people? Morrison took only a moment. The matter with us, he said, is you. And then he was gone.